balance of time to uh, Mr. Roscoe. I thank the gentleman, and uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, I really appreciate, uh, Congressman McCarthy, your leadership this afternoon and this evening and this opportunity to have a conversation and really to reflect on what it is that we've been sent here to do. I know that I and my colleagues that join me here on the floor, Mr. Speaker, are people that that came here as problem solvers. We didn't come here to fight partisan fights. We didn't come here to have sharp elbows. We didn't come here to call people names, but we came here to try and get something done. And we represent districts that are really common sense districts that have a high expectation of this process. And I know that um, all of us uh, who are on the floor today, we don't celebrate in the very low view that the American public has of the Congress under this current leadership. We don't celebrate in that at all. And in fact, um, we mourn that in, in many ways because there's been a real lack of leadership and a lack of an opportunity. You know, I think when, when, whenever you have conversations about um, how you're doing so far, and this is our third quarterly report that the Republican freshmen are participating in, um, it, it's always in the context of looking at what the expectations were as uh, the 2006 elections came about, what was it that people said that the American people trusted in, that the American people believed in, and the American people cast their votes for? What was it, that rhetoric, that called people forth? And I think we don't have to go very far um, to really look at the rhetoric from the 2006 campaign and look at the comparison to the accomplishments in 2007, and you can see why 89% of the American public says, that's not what I voted for. So let's just kind of refresh our memories. First off was that we were going to be a very hard-working Congress and that the 109th Congress, we were told, was um, essentially lazy and wasn't accomplishing anything. And that was the characterization of the previous Congress under the previous leadership. In fact, we were told that the next year members of the House will be expected in the Capitol votes each week by 6.30 p.m. and will finish their business by about 2 p.m. on Fridays, we were told by then minority um, Whip Hoyer. Well, as it's, as it's come into fruition, here we are. It's 5.40 p.m. in Washington, D.C. Plenty of time for us to be doing substantive work, amending bills, debating bills, considering things. We could all be in committees, and yet the House is quiet today. And here we have this time to be reflecting on what the performance has been. And I regret that. My sense is that we're here to work and we're willing to work and we're anxious to work. And yet the way that the uh, majority has structured the calendar, there's simply too much time. Of the 21 weeks in session, only six have included five full days of work. And that's according to the official um, website of the clerk of the House of Representatives. Or we were told um, that the members of the House would have at least 24 hours to examine a bill in a conference report text prior to floor consideration. That's what um, the gentlelady from California, Mrs. Pelosi, said in her publication, A New Direction for America. Um, she also said, and it was reported in the Washington Post, that she would insist that bills be made available to the public at least 24 hours before they would be voted on by the full House. And yet the reality... Mr. Speaker, is far different than that. You know, it's one thing to not make a big deal about something in a campaign and then follow through and you keep, keep things the way it is, but it's an entirely different situation to create this overarching sense of expectation, to create this sort of nirvana invitation to come to this new 110th Congress where everything is fantastic and uh, you're just going to love serving here, and yet the harsh reality is this. Uh, the following bills did not enjoy that generous 24 hours notice. The, the following bills are H.R. 1, the very first bill of this new Congress. H.R. 1 didn't enjoy a 24-hour notice period. Now, let's think about it. Is 24-hour notice the biggest deal in the world? No, frankly, it's not. It is not the biggest deal in the world. And there's a little bit of process argument to it, and there's a little bit of an inside baseball feel to it. But the point is the majority, the current majority leadership created the expectation that 24-hour notice was going to be the standard. So here's just a few things. H.R. 1, H.R. 2, H.R. 3, 
H.R. 4, all of the first bills, no 24-hour notice. H.R.E.S. 35, the Intelligence Oversight Authority, not the ability to have 24 hours notice. H.R.E.S. 296, um, H. Conrad 63, and on and on and on. No 24-hour notice. Or we were told by Mrs. Pelosi in the last election cycle, she, she's quoted as saying this, Rules governing floor debate must be reported before 10 p.m. for a bill to be considered the following day. Sounds fantastic. Sounds great. Makes all the sense in the world, that declaration. But, but the problem, you see, is that the Democrat majority leadership hasn't followed through on that. So and as on, we're reflecting today, as we're looking about at what is it, how is it that an institution that is to be celebrated an institution that is to be admired, an institution that is to be respected, is now down um, at an approval rating at an all-time low. I regret that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sad about that. I don't celebrate in that. And I think what has happened is that the American people have come to the conclusion that the rhetoric of the Democrat majority, the rhetoric of the leadership of the Democratic Party, the rhetoric of the last campaign simply doesn't match with the reality of what they've been seeing in Congress. And so the, the promise to make this the most ethical group in history hasn't come to fruition. The promise to be fiscally disciplined has not come to fruition. The, pros, the, the promise to make this uh, process open and accessible to all hasn't come to fruition. So I think that, Mr. Speaker, in large part, is why we're now at this historic low of 11 percent. I think we can do better. I think that um, there are some of us who are on the floor this afternoon and this evening who want to be problem solvers. There are some of us who want to try and get things done. There are some of us who understand that living within our means makes means making fundamental decisions and fundamental choices and we were elected as leaders and yet sometimes there's a temptation and I sense this on the majority side on the on the leadership side and the majority side that they want to simply kick the can down the down the lane and and have another Congress make the tough decisions well I don't know about you Mr. Speaker but I was sent here to make tough choices and I stand ready with these good colleagues and we're here calling balls and strikes we don't come in as harsh critics of everything, um, we're not coming in simply about donkeys and elephants necessarily, but we're here talking about those types of things that ought to bring us together as Americans, and that is that ability to work together towards solutions to make the tough choices now and not defer those to a future generation. And with that, I thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the gentleman from California, and I yield back the balance of my time.